This series of podcasts on domestic violence during the pandemic in Sri Lanka is an initiative by the Center for Equality and Justice in collaboration with the Forum Against Gender-Based Violence. Welcome to the second episode of uh, Center for Equality and Justice podcast series on domestic violence during the pandemic. I am Thiagi Piedasa, attorney at law uh, and consultant to CEJ. I am joined today by Marini de Rivera, uh, who is a human rights lawyer by profession, uh, and she's the chairperson at Sisters at Law. Uh, Marini holds uh, LLB from the Open University of Sri Lanka and an LLM from the University of Colombo. She's also a licentiate teacher with Trinity College London. Uh, and more importantly, she's also a former chairperson of the National Child Protection Authority of Sri Lanka. Thank you so much, Marini, Thank for joining you us. for having me. Um, so, Marini, if you could tell us a bit about how the pandemic affected, uh, you know, survivors of domestic violence in seeking justice. Uh, you know, were they able to access courts during this time? Uh, it, it was really uh, tough for them to access courts, uh, especially during the first wave when there was a lockdown. I got this call from a young mother in Polonarua, and she said, tonight, my husband is going to uh, kill me. He's going to slice me and the two children. She had an infant in her arms and another toddler. So uh, during the lockdown, I used my lawyer's pass, and I uh, went to get her to Polonarua. Uh, when I reached uh, her abode, uh, it, it was in an elephant-infested area. So I quickly went there, grabbed the... Uh, little child and she came running with the toddler. And, and then when we went uh, uh, to the police station, they had other priorities. They were not in a hurry to take down her complaint. And then we, with the greatest difficulty, we made the complaint and went to the Polonaru hospital. And, and there the, they wanted to get her warded. So, so I said I had to return to Colombo the same day and I needed a medical report to go to court and get a protection order for her. And uh, they very reluctantly, you know, uh, directed me to the judicial medical officer and I got a copy of the medical report. And then we proceeded to the magistrate's court and the uh, courts had put up its shutters. But when I explained about the situation to the security, uh, they, they called the judge and the judge came and we got the protection order. So that, that was how uh, things happened. But not every survivor who could go through these uh, uh, stages that I just described to you. So it, it was a not a very satisfactory situation. Yeah. Um, and then also, Marini, uh -huh. uh, for example, you know, during this time, especially during the lockdowns, uh, courts also uh, limited the number of cases that they yes. could hear. But certain cases, they made an exception, you know, on an urgent basis, it could be heard. Yes. Was domestic violence one of these exceptions? Uh, where sadly, domestic violence was not one of the exceptions because I went to several uh, registrars and I uh, tried to, you know, persuade them to uh, include uh, these uh, protection order applications uh, as, as an urgent uh, matter, but uh, they were reluctant to do. They, they were not aware and they had not been instructed. I see. Um, <clears throat> and then also, you know, mid-2021, um, the government also passed the Coronavirus Disease uh, 2019 Temporary yes. Special Provisions yes. Act, uh, which made provision for digital hearings. Uh, in your experience, were digital hearings used for domestic violence cases? Again, I had another um, client a victim of violence with three small children uh, who was very scared to meet the perpetrator and was very scared to leave the shelter and, and go to court. So I made inquiries about digital hearings and they said that uh, only certain courts had that facility and most courts did not have the, uh, the facility of uh, virtual hearings. So also, Marini, at this time, like we know that uh, you know, communicating protection orders to the various authorities, especially the police. Um, how would you describe the situation during COVID? Before, as well as during COVID, how were courts communicating these protection orders to the respondent, uh, to the police, um, you know, through the registries? How did that work practically? Early, earlier, it was bad enough, it was slow, but here it was uh, almost impossible to get it across. And uh, I wish to state here that uh, the probation department was not taking in uh, children in need of care and protection. So that was a huge uh, problem uh, because there was a 16-year-old girl who had been abandoned. She had uh, the 
agent had given a false age and brought her to a house and that household did not want to keep her. So she was on the streets and uh, then the relevant police station was not uh, taking any responsibility and uh, she was out there. So the women's groups came and approached me and usually I don't keep in my shelter without a court order, but I was forced to keep her without a court order for a few days uh, till courts were accessible and till courts were willing to, you know, open up and uh, hear this case. So also just to confirm also yeah. to, you know, the audience yeah. that's uh, the listening here. Um, so is it that the courts did not hear domestic violence cases or what was the procedure for, you know, if there was a case of domestic violence, how would you seek a protection order in court yes. during this time? So uh, as lawyers, we first approach the registry. But if the registrar is unaware mm. of, of it, whether such cases are taken up, mm -hmm. uh, then we can't proceed beyond that. Mm -hmm. So so uh, there, there was lack of communication. Yes. But in the case, for example, in Polo Narua, yes. uh, you were still able to contact the judge, judge and, yeah, and yeah. get a protection order. Yes. So in certain exceptional circumstances, yeah, yeah, it was yes, still possible yeah, to yeah. get a protection order. Uh, Marlene, with regard to the Coronavirus Disease 2019 um, Temporary Special Provisions Act. Uh, so, you know, we know that the act provides uh, for, you know, the time bar, it provides for alternate courts, um, and also it provides for uh, situations of digital hearings. So in your opinion, has this benefited, uh, you know, domestic violence survivors? Actually, when a new act is passed, such as uh, the one you're referring to, uh, you have to create awareness am among the people and among the stakeholders uh, about this act in, in a very simple format, uh, either through posters or at prime time on television. Or in some countries I have seen, even when you're traveling by train, you see it displayed. If you have a problem, this is what you have to do. And then outside the courthouse, uh, on the notice board, you can have a very colorful, striking, eye-catching poster saying this is what you can do. Uh, if you have come for a maintenance case, you can do this. If you are a lawyer appearing in DV cases, this is what you can do. But I didn't see any of that. So it's not good enough uh, uh, passing laws and the mentoring law books if the public are not aware of it and there's no sensitization of the public that such a law is in place. You cannot make use of the uh, mechanisms that have been put in place by that law if the public are unaware of the law. So. That and didn't also, happen. Exactly. And also in, in sort of in practical terms, yeah. did it benefit women? Like, did it benefit survivors of domestic violence? No, survivors are in a you know, terrible state. You know, they have suffered uh, psychological violence. They can't think for them, themselves and they just come running and ask for help. So they can't be looking for sections of this act and, you know, saying, oh, I want to go to a virtual hearing instead of going to court. No, they are not aware of those uh, uh, options. So it's very important that you uh, uh, create awareness among the grassroots uh, government officers, such as women development officers, psychosocial officers, probation officers, child protection officers, uh, who are there at divisional secretariat level and district level at Pradeshia Sabha and uh, uh, district uh, secretary's office, that such provisions are available and whom to access. That kind of network has to be built up alongside with the passage of this act. So, Marini, if I may be as bold to ask you, so, I mean, if you were to improve on this act, yeah. what would you think needs to be included to make yes. it practically important? Yes, first you have to get uh, people like us who work at grassroots level on a daily basis, who operate a hotline and who uh, work with uh, women and children who suffer family violence and who provide uh, spaces for these people. Uh, to relax and decide what they are going to do uh, and, and check the impact of the act because this act was passed in 2005 and it's 2022 so you have to check the impact what has worked and what has not worked and, and then incorporate uh, those recommendations into the act. Sadly we tried to do this in 2018. I chaired a committee when I was a member of the National Committee on Women and we came up with so many uh, new additions and amendments to the act, but it did not see the light of day. So uh, that's yeah. what happened. So we, we, we as the women's movement should push for mm -hmm. the passage of uh, a new domestic violence act. 
with all these changes incorporated. Thank you so much, Marini. Um, and also Thank for you. those of you who are watching, uh, if you want to reach out to uh, any service, uh, please um, watch at the end. We will provide you with a list of hotlines that you can access for, uh, for the uh, response to uh, incidents of domestic violence. Thank you very much, Marini. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure.